Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for staying for the last presentation today. Um, so my name is Eistan Gravel, and I work for the uh, Alibaba Cloud. Uh, and I'm here to talk about the PolarDB, which is a database architecture for the cloud. Uh, so before working for Alibaba, I used to work for Oracle in the MySQL optimizer team for 10 years, and have uh, been working on databases for 25 years or so. So um, at Alibaba, we have a lot of uh, databases. Uh, I'm not sure how much you know about uh, Alibaba, but you can think of it as uh, uh, the Chinese version of Amazon, PayPal, and uh, eBay, and YouTube, and what name it, uh, it combined. Uh, so there's uh, a lot of, uh, so it's the biggest e-commerce site in, uh, in um, China. We also have a cloud offering that is the biggest in China. So, um, uh, the, um, um, so the e-commerce of Alibaba, they have like uh, uh, sales, sales for one trillion, trillion US dollars a year. Uh, I believe that is something like, uh, is it 70 lakh crore, you would call it, or something like that. And there's a lot of data, petabyte of, da uh, of data. And on average, there's like 100 million transactions a day. But that is not even over the year or, or, or every day. Some day, days of the year, there's much more. There's a special day in China they call the singles day because it's all 11-11, all once, uh, where, the, where the total Alibaba sales is many times higher than what you get on uh, Amazon on Cyber Monday or uh, Prime Day. Now, the numbers for, uh, for Cyber Monday is for the entire U.S. sales. So you can see that the, just the sales for Alibaba is much higher. And when November 11 arrives, we need to be able to handle a load that is 100 times higher. You see that when you go uh, here, you see the load as approaching midnight, and then it goes up. Then all the people have already have put all their uh, goods in their sales baskets, uh, and they are just ready to uh, push on uh, order on this day. So we need to have a setup where we can keep the latency for the, all these customers uh, stable. They should not experience any slower uh, 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 process than they uh, used to. And one thing, good thing about the cloud is that you don't have to buy all the uh, hardware that you need. If you are some, some Chinese company, for example, that need, are preparing for uh, November 11, uh, you don't need to buy all the hardware that you, to be able to handle this load. You can, if you use the, uh, uh, the cloud instead, then you move your capital expenses to variable uh, operational expenses, so you can actually just pay for extra compute, compute when you need it. And the forecast says that by 2020, like 83% of the enterprise workloads will be in the cloud. And it's, all, it's not only about cloud. We see that the amount of data that people store, store becomes higher and higher. Uh, and one of the main reasons for that is that it's no longer just humans that enters data into the database. You have the Internet of Things. There's a lot of things, sensors and so out there, that stores a lot of data into the databases. The, so the storage needed is uh, increasing expo exponentially. So we want to have a, a database that is specially tutored or tailored for, for, the, for the cloud. It needs to be scalable. It needs to scale automatically when you get more load. You, not to, you need to scale both on load and on storage. Uh, it needs to be highly available. Uh, you need to have multiple copies of the data, so if there's one copy is uh, not available, you still are able, uh, are, uh, able to serve your uh, customers. You need to be able to fail over to another machine if the, the current machine is failing. And the, the user should experience zero downtime. downtime. Uh, 
And we want this database to integrate with all the other cloud services. You have cloud services for security, for monitoring, for uh, artificial intelligence, and so on. So here is where PolarDB comes in, which is, uh, is uh, Alibaba's, uh, Alibaba Cloud's uh, answer to these, or solutions for these uh, requirements. So PolarDB will use uh, special hardware in order to provide uh, uh, the good performance for the database. It's, the, it's using auto-scaling. You have the usual, you pay with how much you use and so on as in cloud. You, you, get, you get all the security from the cloud and there's a lot of uh, automation in there uh, that uh, people are used to from the cloud. So first I will talk about the storage part of this uh, architecture. Um, so um, Polar Store is our uh, uh, it's a specialized distributed uh, storage uh, layer. So uh, used by the Polar DB. So Polar Store has a lot of chunk servers. Each chunk contains some uh, gigabytes of data, and each chunk will be in uh, several copies across uh, the storage. And the database will connect to this storage um, by uh, embedding a, a, a special library that uh, communicate with the uh, database storage. So this polar switch component and now it knows which chunk should have which, no, which chunk server should have each chunk. So, so the polar DB uh, uh, does not uh, just see the storage as, it, as if it was a local storage. Uh, all the magic happens in the uh, layers, uh, the polar switch. And special hardware is here used to get the good performance. We use the RDMA network, which is a protocol where you actually uh, can write into uh, memory on another computer. Uh, and this is used both from the database down into the uh, chunk servers and to communicate between chunk servers. The, a chunk server has both obtained disks and uh, uh, NVMe SSDs. The obtained disks are used, uh, obtained uh, memory, I mean, it's used to, to uh, which is uh, non-volatile memory, it, it, it's used to get the, uh, a, a short latency a low latency. So um, when you write, uh, the chunk server will have a write-ahead log, which it, it, it writes to the obtain, uh, and then it can acknowledge back to the uh, client that uh, the uh, storage has been uh, uh, stored. Uh, and then the actual uh, chunks will go into the SSDs. But that is not inside the critical path. You don't have to wait for that to happen before uh, uh, acknowledging the right. Um, let's see, I think I must, lost my speaker notes there, but I think I've said what I just uh, said. Yeah, the slides I have uh, uploaded on uh, uh, SlideShare, so if you go to the WooConf uh, schedule and click on my presentation, you will, like, you will see the links to the slides. Yep. Yeah, and as I said, the, uh, mentioned earlier, you have the the lib uh, polar fs uh, library that does the uh, actually uh, that uh, interfaces to polar store, and this runs in user space, so you don't have the uh, overhead of context switching for uh, for um, going to storage, and also there's no uh, no system calls, no. Uh, data copying, you know, when you do the I.O. So this Polar Store uh, uh, architecture was presented in a, a, a system article at the uh, VLDB conference last year. So then we go on to the next the point there in the architecture, and that is the separation of storage and compute. You want to separate storage from computation so that you can scale these independently. So that you don't have to, uh, if you need more compute, as we do, for example, for the 
for the November 11, uh, you don't have to add a lot of extra disk uh, at the same time because you don't necessarily need more storage. Uh, and this is a, a principle that are used by many of the cloud-specific databases. If you look at Amazon's Aurora, for example, they also uh, separate the compute and the storage. And in Azure, you have the same with hyperscale, I think, is the name of that database. So the architecture is that they have the Polar Store, then you have the Polar DB, and on top of, as I already mentioned, that uses the Polar file system, and on top of that, we have an intelligent proxy that will uh, route the request to different uh, replicas of the Polar DB. I will show more details on, on this. Uh, and this um, architecture you can use with uh, different databases, MySQL, Postgres, and so on. Uh, I will talk about MySQL here, since that's what I know uh, uh, about, and what we have done most work on. So, so PolarDDB is a, actually a modified uh, MySQL, and mostly a modified storage engine, InnoDB storage engine in, my, in MySQL. So what is the difference between PolarDB and a traditional uh, uh, MySQL. The big difference is that this, uh, when, you have, when you are replicating in MySQL, you are sending the binary log uh, to different uh, uh, nodes, and they will all store their uh, data in local storage. While in PolarDB, a sh shared storage is used. There's one single master that do does all the writes, and then the replicas can read from, uh, from the shared storage. There are several advantages of this. One is the fast scaling. Because uh, if you need to add another replica, you can just add it in a short time because you don't have to copy any data. All the data is here in the st shared storage. If you need to provision a new uh, replica in a MySQL, traditional MySQL architecture, you would do, have to copy all the data over to the local storage of the, of the uh, new uh, replica. And also, since we are adding replica, we don't these uh, machines we are using for the replicas don't have to have the amount of storage that you need in MySQL. So as you are adding more and more replicas, you see that the cost saving will increase because we can use uh, cheaper um, uh, machines or the user can buy uh, uh, machines or, or, or uh, rent machines in the cloud with, with, with a lower capacity and st still uh, uh, be able to serve the replicas. Uh, another difference is that in PolarDB we use physical replication. If you know about MySQL replication, I've heard, you have heard about the bin log, which ac is actually a logical representation of the changes you are made row by row, if you use row-based row based replication, which you should. Um, so, but uh, that means that a master in MySQL will do a lot of more writes because it needs to write the data to local storage, it needs to write the bin log to local storage, and it needs to write the redo log of InnoDB, the physical log that you, uh, that you need to have to do recovery of, of your uh, data. And it, then it sends the, sends the bin log over to the slave, and the slave writes the data the bin log it received, and the bin log it generates, and the redo log to storage. So there's a lot of writes here that we can optimize by using a physical log instead, because uh, uh, using the redo log instead, because then the master just writes the data and the redo log to shared storage, and the slave can just read what it needs from shared storage. And one an another advantage of using physical replication is uh, around if you do uh, data dictionary changes. Um, oh, one uh, known problem with the MySQL replication is that if you, for example, do an alter table that takes very long, this example shows add column, um, uh, then your load, uh, it will take one hour, for example, to do this operation, and then you send it to the uh, to the slave, 
and then the, the slave will need one hour to do the operation because the, opera the, the, uh, the, the operation is not sent to the slaves before it's completed on the master. And while the slave does the operation, no other load can happen on the slave because uh, it needs to, the new version of the table first. But if you have shared storage, then actually uh, the change on the slave is just a metadata update. You ne just need to tell the, uh, the slave to use the new version of, uh, of the data files in the shared storage. Uh, this example with add column is kind of moot in 8.0 because uh, in uh, 8.0, MySQL added uh, instant add column. But there are other, uh, other uh, d data schema change to operation that still takes a long time and that will b block the, the slags from uh, continuing. So how does this uh, actually work? Uh, we look at the changes we do have done to InnoDB uh, in this case. So on the um, let's see now. Uh, so this shows just uh, one node. Um, in InnoDB, there was, will be a lot of small transactions that represent each operations that are done to. Uh, the, the physical layout of the database. That is not the same as the transaction that you have in a, uh, in, 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 at the user level. It's more like, like one transaction can be to change some data in some page. Some, tra some transaction will have multiple log records because, for example, if you do a B3 split, then you have one log record to make a new page, one log record to copy data from the old page to the new page, log records to change the pointers between pages and so on. So all these uh, redo log records, they are written to the redo log. So, and that has to happen before uh, you commit the transaction. That is what is called write ahead logging. And traditionally, what you do is, in order to get better performances, you do so-called group commit. You group transaction together so that you can uh, write multiple transactions to disk in one uh, in, in one write. Um, otherwise, you, if you have to write one transaction and then wait for the I/O to complete and another to write another transaction, it takes too long time. And then the data is is flushed asynchronously uh, to disk. So if 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 uh, the node crashes, then all the data pages are not necessarily up to date. So when you come back up again, you have to do redo. And the redo is to uh, take the log and then redo it on the data so it c becomes up to date. Because the re lo you have all the log, but you don't ha necessarily have up to date data in, in the physical image on your disk when the crash happens. So the idea of, of physical replication is that the slave or uh, replica basically is continuously doing redo. The uh, master ha works as before. It writes the redo log records to, uh, before commit, write ahead logging, uh, flushes the buffer pool asynchronously. Uh, then on the slave, uh, the slave um, will read the log records, apply them uh, to the pages, uh, continuously. What actually happens there is that there is a hash table. So you will hash on page ID for each log record uh, uh, and put it in because then you can do each bucket of your hash tables can be performed in parallel. So you can actually uh, do a uh, have re efficient redo by doing all these log records in parallel because you know if they are uh, log records for different pages, they do not conflict. That is also an advantage of physical replication because if you have the normal um, bin log uh, replication in MySQL, what you know is that all the transactions that are, that are in the same group commit, they can, you can do in parallel. But you cannot, then for the next group commit, you have to wait until those are completed before you uh, do in parallel. So the parallelization is, is less with the group commit than with actually parallelizing every operation that goes to different pages. Yeah. 
So, and the, uh, one, one basic thing here is that they say that this, the status of the slave is, or the snapshot of the slave is the latest log record passed. So here the slap state is the snapshot of T4 because T4 ha has been passed and put into the hash table. T5 has not yet been passed by the, uh, by the slave. There are some things we need to take care of uh, when we do it like this. Uh, we have to change InnoDB uh, to take to make sure that uh, the master and the slaves are synchronized. For example, uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that these log records, they are only applied for uh, pages that are in memory. For pages that you do, uh, is referred in the redo log, log record, but which the sl uh, slave does not have in memory, it just ignores the redo log record for now. Uh, because hopefully, when it, if it later needs the page, these updates have already been applied to the page on the master and flushed the disk. So it actually sees uh, the updates. And if, and if not, it will still have the log records and can redo it at that point in order to get it up to date to the snap, T4 snapshot in this case. So if, for example, it reads a new page from disk here and it has log records, Early, from earlier than T4 that is not applied, then it has to redo them at that point. But that means that there will be a lot of log records um, that are um, in queue here on the slave, uh, and sooner or later you need to delete them. And what you do then is uh, that the uh, uh, slave, the master tells the replicas the checkpoint LSN. When a, master, when a database does checkpointing, it writes all the dirty pages before a certain point to disk. So it knows that every, every record before the uh, log record before the checkpoint is sent is no longer necessary to keep because it, it's, uh, the pages has been written to disk. So it can delete all log records uh, uh, that it... Um, that are earlier than the checkpoint. And also, um, there needs to be some synchronization between uh, this, uh, the master and the slave because um, the database has an undo log or rollback segments, which means that it um, it needs to, if a transaction are in flight and then you need to roll it back, it needs to find the operation so it can actually undo them. And, and the master must not delete, and the master will delete the undo log record when it, it thinks that it's not needed anymore. So the replicas have to make sure that it does not delete too old, uh, no, too, too new undo log before they are finished with it. Because this undo log, in, in MySQL and Postgres and many databases uses so-called multi-version concurrency control, which means that um, this only log is not only done, only used for rollback, it's only used to find an earlier version of a, pay, of a page. Because uh, you are able, you can, if you, when you start a transaction, you want to see this snapshot of the, of the reality for the rest of your transaction. So if someone later does some updates, we will actually uh, uh, undo these updates for this particular transaction so that it sees a consistent view. Uh, so uh, the replicas needs to tell the uh, master the oldest uh, view of the current, contract, current transaction so it doesn't uh, delete undo log that is newer than this uh, view. Yeah, so, so the title of the slide was page from the past. That is that you, when you read in one page and it's not up to date, you have to find the log records and, uh, and, uh, and uh, redo them. Uh, what about pages from the future? What if you, uh, the, uh, you have the snapshot of T4 is the state on, on the replica here, the read-only node. Uh, what if the primary has written some newer version of the page 
to uh, this call ready, and the uh, the, uh, re the read only node will read this page uh, that is newer than a snapshot. How can it get back to the old snapshot it actually need? And the answer is that we need that is, should not be possible. We just prevent that from happening. So the, all the read-only nodes will, will tell which version of the page it actually is on and to the master. So the master will hold on and flushing uh, to uh, these pages to disk until uh, the replicas are up to date. So that's some of the details of the changes we have made to InnoDB in order to make this for work in a, in, a, in a shared storage physical replication setting. So what will happen, uh, what the setup will normally be is that you have, will have uh, an application and a proxy and then you have a single master here and then you have multiple replicas and you can need, add as many replicas as you need. And the, the proxy will then do load balancing. It will do read-write split, which means that it will, can send the writes to the master and the reads to the replicas. It can uh, do load balancing so that each replica has uh, about the same amount of no, lo, uh, load. If, if the master goes down, it will be able to switch to uh, another replica will become the master and the... Uh, the um, the proxy will make sure to route the, uh, uh, the update load to the new master. But we also want, we do read write split, but we also want the application to be able to see its own updates. So we have to, for example, if we, uh, if an we send the writes to the master and then we send the read, a later read for the same transaction, from the same uh, connection to, to the a read replica, then you must make sure that the update from the master has already be, been applied so that you see this, see your own updates. For example, here's an example where first someone updates the name of a user to Jimmy and then he commits the update and then it later se selects the name for this user ID. And then it needs to, the, uh, the uh, application expects to see Jimmy and not some other, the previous name. So what we do that then is that when you do the update on the master, you return the log sequence number, the, the number of the log record for this update, and the, the read replica will make sure that uh, uh, you actually have this uh, log record applied before you uh, uh, respond to the, uh, uh, to the read request. And also the load balancer can be smart and if some replicas is lagging behind, it can uh, send it to a more fresh replica so the delay in order to reap, get to the right uh, version is not that big. As I said, we currently only support single master. But the goal is to be able to have multi, multiple master because then uh, now the update load is limited with what, with what one uh, node can uh, process. And the, the idea of what we are working on then is to have uh, multiple uh, availability servers in multiple availability zones and there will be a master for each uh, availability zone and uh, there will be redo log uh, uh, sent between the uh, uh, availability zones to update the different uh, database servers. Um, we also were uh, addressing what has, during the last, uh, I'm not sure how many of you have heard about HTAP before. It's kind of been popularized the last few years. It stands for uh, hybrid transaction and analytical processing. The ability to do both uh, OLTP and OLAP on your same system. Both transaction processing and analytics on your sa the same system. And uh, the idea here is to have special uh, read-only nodes where you do your OLAP uh, uh, 
uh, low uh, queries so that they do not interfere with the online transaction processing but still can access the same data. But the assumption here with this, this shared storage is that the, the, the bandwidth of this storage is so big that it can actually serve both purposes. Um, um, yeah. And this is a big advantage because, you know, in many systems you actually have one OLTP system. Then you have to copy all your data over to some uh, analytic system. For example, you copy it over into Redshift or to some other systems that can do the, your complex queries. But if you can do complex queries on the same uh, shared storage, then you don't have to do this copying. You will also get more up-to-date uh, data to work on because you don't have the lag of uh, refreshing your analytic system. Uh, but in order to support the OLAP uh, with MySQL, since the shared storage will have uh, data in InnoDB uh, uh, format, so we actually we need to use something that understands the InnoDB format here, that is MySQL. Okay. Um, so, um, what we want to do is to be, make MySQL better to do analytics. One of the problems today is that uh, MySQL, you can only have one th user thread, or one thread per uh, user connection. So, so uh, when you get open a connection to MySQL, you get a thread, and then thread does all the work for this user, except some IO and uh, but the, the main work of, of, of the system. So, what we are working on is a parallel query pro project, so actually, uh, you can have multiple threads executing a single query. So then we, what we do is we have one leader, uh, which is the original thread, and then we use multiple worker threads that will read parts of our table or our index in parallel. And we are able to push down uh, joins, aggregation, filterings to these worker threads so they can op do these operations on parts of, of of the da database in parallel. And we see the result so far is uh, uh, pretty scaly, scaling for some of the uh, queries like TP2 3 query 6, which is a single table uh, query where you aggregate information. Uh, and we see that there's some uh, almost linear scaling here if you uh, use 32 um, workers on a 32 core machine uh, for pretty da big data volumes. Like uh, the biggest one here is TPC40, which is like uh, 40 gigabyte uh, uh, database. So uh, well, uh, there's a DBT3 is a open source version of the TPCH benchmark, which is um, a standard benchmark for uh, analytic uh, queries. Um, so the goal is to be able to do this on the same system as the OLTP. Uh, uh, and we can uh, also scale linear for some joins. Some of the, uh, we have some issues with InnoDB and scaling uh, on uh, secondary indexes in parallel. This is an, a known problem that has been reported by other people too, that if you scan InnoDB secondary indexes in parallel, you, there's uh, not a linear scale. So, uh, for example, if you have a, uh, secondary index or a join that using secondary indexes, is mo the scaling is more in the order of 15 instead of 30 that you see for this query. So to sum up, um, what advantages give is that we give this architecture for uh, a database in the cloud is, first point is that we can independently scale the storage and the compute. We, don't, we can have uh, uh, nodes that are good on compute but does not have much storage for the processing part, and then you have the backend that does the storage for you. And that means lower ca cost than adding more read replicas. Uh, the shared storage has high throughput uh, to multiple nodes, low latency through the uh, obtain uh, hardware. You get high availability through uh, multiple copies of the same data, and scaling, fast scaling. 
we saw that the physical replication gave you less I.O. You don't have to write the binary log and so on. Uh, you get non-blocking DDL, and you got, get efficient parallel reader on slaves, so, since you can do each page in parallel. And with parallel query execution, we will also get lower latency for the complex queries uh, in this architecture. So that's all I have. Thank you. Any questions? So how we handle the uh, split brain problem when you have the shared storage, shared between master and slave both. So let's say with three replica, two guys assume it, like they become master and they start sending the same data to the shared storage. How we, how that situation is handled in Polar TV? I think you need a quorum. Uh, now I'm not the expert on the storage layer, but as far as I understand, you need a quorum. So if you don't have two of the copies, you, I don't think you can, uh, but so, I'm not sure. Uh, within that. a cluster, if two guys, there is a gap in communication and two guys assume as a master at some point of time because of lack of communication and the quorum went in like two guys at the same time assumed as a master, then how we handle the shared thing, like data will get corrupt in that case. But if you have three nodes and you need to have connection to at least one other in order to be a master, then doesn't that solve your problem? Uh, let's say I have five nodes and then two nodes assumed as a master in a cluster. There is a communication gap within, within, the, within the cluster and then two master at a time assumed as a, two nodes in a cluster assumed as a master. I, I, I don't know, know the details there, but one thing I was on the slide, but I didn't mention, the, the graph protocol is used in order to coordinate this uh, at the storage level. And uh, there's, and they, in fact, they implement their uh, own parallel raft because the original raft protocol was not uh, efficient enough for, for this uh, purpose. Is there any other, uh, is there any method of, let's say, if your shared storage got corrupt because of some reasons, uh, how we can recover other than the snapshot way? Uh, I don't know that uh, details on the, the storage level, uh, what happens there, sorry. Hi. With automated backups, do you take uh, backups of the storage? Yes. Um, um, yes, I think that's, uh, yeah, yeah, you take the backup at the storage level, so you don't really uh, have, as a database user, I don't think that's uh, is, uh, visible to you. Uh, I, don't, um, I don't have any experience with that, but I don't think so, because uh, uh, there should be sufficient uh, capacity in the storage layer for this. Uh, I have a question here. Yeah. So what's the largest uh, deployment uh, that you have in production? Um, what's the data size? I, I, I haven't the really, real really details there, but I think there's a couple of petabytes. There. Because one, the, I think so far the major motivation for moving from RDS to PolarDB has been to get uh, around the limitation of what you can store on a single, single, uh, uh, single machine. So, so many of the first customers to go, it was to actually to get a bigger storage for, for, for uh, their... Uh, uh, I, I don't think I mentioned that part, that uh, PolarDB is, was made uh, originally for MySQL 5.6. Uh, we are, have been up, uh, up, uh, merging it with eight, uh, MySQL 8.0, so there, there's a better lead release coming out soon with MySQL uh, 8.0 uh, uh, also. But since, uh, because of the ha extra hardware here, it, it has only been uh, available in China so far. But they, they, uh, as far as I understand, they are moving it to other data centers. Uh, I'm not sure, there are two, Alibaba have two data centers here in India, but I don't think they, it's available there yet. So, 
so the scaling on my scale is to add more re read replicas. So that is. Uh, so that's for the read road, uh, load, right? How yeah. about the write load? Uh, okay, so, so that's, uh, as I said, that's, uh, the limitation is that you uh, only can write as much as one master can handle. So if you need to go beyond that, you have to shard currently. But the goal is to be able to support multi-master, but that, I think that's, um, that's, um, need some work to do. Uh, also Amazon uh, Aurora, they only, until recently, they support only one master in their, uh, uh, system too. They have some uh, activity on multi-masters. Uh, I'm not sh quite sure what the state on, on that is. There. So would that mean that PolarDB scales very well for read sort of queries and less for write sort of queries? So yeah, for write it will scale up to what one uh, node. But often if you can split off all the read write, uh, read load, that is uh, often uh, sufficient. So in PolarDB cluster, it writes to only one master, is it? Uh, yes, there, yeah. There's one master, and the writes go to this master, and that's the only one who writes to the shared storage. Okay. Uh, do we, I mean, PolarDB handles uh, isolation levels? Yes, that's uh, no difference from, uh, that's uh, okay. from MySQL, it's the usual, uh, uh, I'm not, Yeah, but if you if you require, for example, serializability, you would all your load would have to go to the master, I would think. But the for the lower levels, you will have you can use multi-version concurrency control to actually make sure that you see the 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 right version of the of the data, and then I guess you can use the uh, synchronization I showed between master and slaves to make sure that you have the same snapshot on both. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Oyster.